Welcome, you happy warrior, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. And one way in which the world really works is that we all find ourselves at different times a little bit down, feeling a little less optimistic, a little less hopeful, more anxious about different things. Sometimes you're not even sure what it is that makes you feel a bit unhappy. And that's partially why I think of you as a happy warrior, because you are grappling with things. You are not a tennis ball floating down the gutter of life. No, you are a happy warrior. And so you are grappling with the forces that resist you, the forces that work against you, making yourself a thinner, stronger, healthier person, the forces making you, that the forces that are trying to stop you from making yourself into a better human being, a better spouse, a better parent, a better child, a better sibling, the forces that work against you, building up some money, building up a fortune, building up some wealth, and you are constantly at battle against these resistive forces that try to block your progress. That is at the heart of what being a happy warrior is all about. And one of the most important struggles that we happy warriors go through is with our own spirits, keeping our own optimism up, keeping ourselves happy, keeping ourselves enthusiastic, keeping ourselves optimistic. Very easy to slide into a mode of negativity. Very easy indeed. And people seek all kinds of mistaken antidotes to that disturbing condition. Normal people feel this. Normal people have this. But today we're going to talk a little bit about the strategies and techniques of ancient Jewish wisdom for combating it because it's unpleasant and worse than that it's destructive it obstructs your progress and so one of those things that the happy warrior is constantly fighting against is the tendency towards a little anxiety a tendency towards a little sadness a tendency towards well call it negativity it's a real tug and so what does ancient Jewish wisdom disclose about this? Well, the very first thing is, hello, welcome to reality. That's right. Fear, uncertainty, anxiety, these are the natural human default. Now, I've mentioned in the past that virtually everything about the human experience can be explained using either of two lenses. Your first lens, which I do not recommend because it runs up short down the road, as I will explain, but the first lens is that we are here as a result of a very, very lengthy process of completely unaided, natural, materialistic evolution that transformed primitive protoplasm into penguins and primates, and little by little, the, uh, the rest of us showed up on the scene. According to that lens, the reason that you have as your natural condition, and I have as my natural default, fear 
concern, worry, anxiety, unhappiness. Well, that approach says, since you are the result of natural evolution, then you are still those old animal instincts of fight or flight, those animal instincts of staying alert to danger. That's all. It's just a lingering vestigial part of your being. Today, you live in a nice condo downtown, and you go to work, and nobody bothers you for the most part, and so you don't need these instincts anymore, but they're still there. Now, that's one approach. The other approach is that no, the other approach is we are here because the good Lord created us and placed us here and has certain expectations of us. And one of those expectations is that we rise above our natures. Yes, he created us both body and soul. He created us with a little bit of animal and a lot of angel. And he expects us to control our bodily appetites with our angelic powers. He expects us to control our bodily tendencies towards fear, anxiety, concern, worry, negativity with our angelic ability to reach for the stars. But one thing is clear, and that is that whether, and by the way, I know you're not going to like to hear this because we all like to have our cake and eat it. We all prefer to be able to have both sides of the argument, but uh, these two are incompatible. There are too many places where you will have to make up your mind. You can't know for sure, but you can make up your mind as to how you want to live your life. Do you want to live your life as if we are indeed descended from baboons and chimpanzees? In which case, you must be willing to accept impertinence, audacity, disobedience, and, uh, and downright unpleasantness from your children, because they see you as one generation closer to baboons and primates and chimpanzees They are one generation more sophisticated, more developed, more advanced, more evolved. So obviously, your children look at you with contempt. Or alternatively, you have to decide uh, to live that as if we were created by God in his image and placed here on this obscure, tiny little planet in a faraway galaxy. And if that's the case... Well, then you can demand of your children that they respect you. You can't force them to love you. You can't even force them to like you. And there I'm touching on territory we covered in the last week or two. Uh, So, uh, But you can insist that they honor you and respect you. And for that, the result of that is happier children and a more functional and successful family. And so, whether you choose to live your life as if we are evolved from baboons and chimpanzees, or whether you choose to live your life as if God created us, one thing is clear. Everybody agrees, and that is innate to us, our default condition, buried within us, is a pull towards down feelings, fears, worries, concerns, pessimism, um, no hope, uh, anxious. And people seek the wrong antidotes to combat this unpleasant feeling that we're all subject to from time to time. One of the things uh, people use is entertainment. Uh, yes, movies, videos, uh, any, all things that we classify under the heading of entertainment. All right, entertainment's not horrible that you should never, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you should be very aware that entertainment is putting a bandage over the real problem. 
Entertainment is meant to distract you, so you cannot think about the fears. You can't worry about the concerns. You can't be frightened of the future because you are busy laughing at the comedy you're watching, or you're being distracted by the drama you're engaged in. But entertainment is one of the most common and popular ways that people use to try and deal with the fact that there is such a thing called spiritual gravity. We all are subject to being pulled downwards, down thinking, down fears, down worries. It is a reality. Now, if it was not a reality, then we would not need certain verses in the five books of Moses. Now, there are many, many more throughout the rest of the scriptures, and I'm not going to uh, do that. That's not what the show is about. But again, if there was not a natural tendency in us, a default condition, that we tend to lean towards that, then you wouldn't have vast armies of mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, all of whom make very good money because so many of us believe that if we go to a so-called mind doctor, they'll be able to make us feel better. It'll all go away. The fears will go away. The sadness will go away. The concerns and worries will evaporate, and there will be nothing but butterflies and rainbows in your life after that. Well, save your money. Really, you can do, you can do better with your money, because for the most part, with few exceptions, that's not where it's going to come from. The antidotes are not entertainment. The antidotes are not therapy or, uh, or counseling or psychologists or psychiatrists. No, uh, this is a very normal and a very natural thing. And the good thing is that the good Lord equipped us with the means of combating it internally. It's not an accident that um, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 11, we have words, and you shall be happy. That's an instruction. It turns out that throughout the five books of Moses, there are 248 instructions of things I am expected to do, and there's 365 items of things that I am prohibited from doing. Okay, so um, I'm not allowed to marry my sister. Right? That's one of the 365 that I'm not allowed to do. Uh, I am obliged to be happy. That's one of the 248 that I have to do. That's right. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 11, and you shall be happy. And it's as clear as could be. You see, you can take it as a general rule that God does not command his children to do anything that comes easy. So in other words, as I've often pointed out, uh, nowhere in the five books of Moses does God say, and you children of Israel, I hereby command you to eat three square meals a day. It doesn't say that. Absolutely doesn't say that. Um, it doesn't say, uh, and now uh, you, you men of Israel, be sure that you don't forget to uh, have regular relations with your wives. No, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but what God does have to do is to tell us to do the things that don't come naturally to us. And that's what Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy 26, 11 is. And you shall be happy. That's right. It's not easy. By no means, because we have a natural default condition in the wrong direction. And that's why, going a little bit further, you'll enjoy Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Uh, there, the uh, discussion is all about uh, the terrible things that befall Israel from time to time. 
Um, most recently, of course, uh, in 1940 uh, to 1944. Uh, and what God says there is, and you want to know why all these things happen? The main reason that these things happen is because you did not worship the, the Lord your God with happiness, in happiness. Because of, after all, all the fantastically good things going on in your life. And there we get something of a clue, something of an insight um, in how we are to best deal with these situations, deal with these problems. Because I think everybody acknowledges that they're real, right? Uh, We all know that bad events or or bad emotions, do affect us much more strongly than positive ones. Uh, How often does it happen? It happens to me as well. It happens to all of us. One word of criticism, particularly from somebody important in one's life, uh, and that that can undo um, praise from many, many, many other people. Um, you, You react to hostility, much more strongly than you do to all the friendliness. Uh, We tend to be more moved by bad news than by all the good news out there, right? And that's, again, just part of the natural tendency of people. If, uh, if, If Sunday morning's newspaper said, another great day in the United States of America... And I know you're listening in many, many countries around the world, and I appreciate it, by the way. And do keep telling me where you're, where you're listening from. I love hearing uh, what places in the world. I love putting new pins in my map. But being as I uh, am living in the United States of America, imagine the Sunday morning paper came out this Sunday and said, another great day in America. 50 million Americans were at church this morning. And there wasn't a single case of pickpocketing, assaults, um, uh, or uh, uh, attacks of any kind. Wow, great. Except nobody would pay attention because we're not hit by good news. And newspapers know this and they want to sell copies. So they they highlight the bad news. We get that. Um, It's a very, very real phenomenon in how human beings are constructed. And if you know it about yourself, then you have to know this is, you know, like you, you, you sometimes, let's say you're somebody who's trying to lose weight. I I just, I'm just picking on that. And you feel the strong urge to raid the refrigerator, right? Or let's imagine that you're trying to exercise regularly and you have the strong urge to just forget to exercise today and do something else. Or you're trying to cut down your screen time watching television and you just feel yourself pulled and drawn to it. So you know that pull, right? That is spiritual gravity pulling you in a direction that will undo your own plans for your life. So you have to just recognize that whenever you feel yourself tugged towards pessimism or worry or even fear, you just have to recognize it's exactly the same thing. You are being pulled in a direction that opposes your own plans and your own drives for your own life. And, uh, and this is, it's just simply a, a reality uh, you know, you, you can almost sort of end up feeling that negative forces are stronger than positive forces. And that's not, not exactly what it means, but at least we should be aware of this in our own lives. And when you are forewarned, well, that means you're also forearmed. And, um, and, and you ha- also have to be aware of it in terms of the impression you make. Uh, let's say that uh, you come late to a meeting. If you show up on time for the next meeting, you haven't erased the bad impression. Nobody says, oh, he's on time. That's great. You have to be on time for the next five or six meetings. And then that erases the one bad impression. See what I'm trying to get across here? This is a really important thing. Um, if uh, If you lose your temper with your family, you get unnecessarily angry with a child. Um, 
if you give the child a candy, that doesn't undo it. And that's not a good idea anyways. But if you maintain a balanced, tranquil uh, attitude of, of, of a leading parent uh, for a, a good period of time, then, then you do erase the, uh, the impression you left. If you say something hurtful to your spouse... Right, you don't make up for it by bringing flowers or by one nice act thereafter, because the bad is sort of stronger than the good. If you if you know what I mean, I've been thinking a little bit about a, a better way to express because I don't like saying bad is stronger than good, or because overall, ultimately, that's not the case. But but certainly in impressions uh, that we make, the result, the consequence of one bad thing. Uh, one bad thing to your reputation is very, very hard to repair. Uh, it, you've got to do a lot of good things over a good period of time to overcome that one bad thing. So uh, this is this is painful. It's difficult to confront and to realize, but you're able to be more effective in life if you do know these realities. And so, as I said, forewarned is forearmed. Be aware, both in your own feelings, in the way you sometimes feel down, be aware that, hey, you have the ability to overcome it. If you didn't, God wouldn't have said, be happy, because you would have said, I can't, I can't, you know, send me good things, then I'll be happy. No, no. It is within our power. A happiness which brings with it optimism and contentment and enthusiasm and hope and fear, a, a, a fearlessness, all of these things are within our own power to bring. Um, first of all, being alone isn't as helpful as being with other people. That helps. Um, do not take refuge in alcohol. You barely need me to tell you that, but it is interesting that uh, the old monks of the early period uh, called alcohol spiritus in Latin, and from that we have uh, the word spirits, right? So to this day, uh, alcohol can sometimes be referred to as spirits, and the reason they did that, the reason they called it that, is because they recognized it had the effect of being able to repair bad spirits, low spirits spirits not meaning ghosts meaning your own spirits your own your own soul uh, again unfortunately like entertainment like pornography like uh, drugs uh, alcohol has a negative long term effect uh, it temporarily gives you relief right i mean i i i totally understand the incredible compulsion i'm not even talking about the addictive aspects but the uh, the uh, the ability to ease some of the pain by just one or two or five or seven drinks, I get. I, I totally understand. But um, better than that, um, connection with people. Uh, better than that, activity, some form of action. Exercise is fantastic uh, for helping to overcome it. Um, another one is doing things that make other people feel good in the process you do as well so those are are some of the tips you may yourself be aware of many others and if so by all means uh, join a conversation on this on um, our facebook page friends of rabbi daniel and susan lappin and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more over there. But I I just had a few encounters with uh, several people this week um, where it dawned on me that there are probably many people listening to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show um, who do not know some of the basic information on negative thinking, on feeling down and anxious and fearful and unhappy uh, and anxiety, all of these things, um, we are conditioned today to believe that they are the result of Donald Trump. <laughs> That's serious. That's what a lot of people say. Or they are the result of uh, 
uh, outside forces of this, that, or the other. No, 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 no. Put all that aside. Uh, this is perfectly natural and perfectly normal. It's, it's a force inside of us. Think of it as spiritual gravity that tends to pull us down, and it requires uh, effort on our part to overcome it. And every time you overcome it, your overcoming muscle gets strengthened. It's a little easier next time. Every time you surrender to it, every time you submit to the negativity and you allow yourself to become dismal and unhappy, well, it just means that that's going to happen more the next time as well. Those are very, very important ancient Jewish wisdom principles for combating this incredible destructive default tendency in all of us, and that is to allow our negative feelings, our unhappiness, our anxieties to overwhelm us and sweep us away in a tsunami of misery. Uh, it obstructs us, it spoils our relationships, it prevents us achieving our goals. But the good news is, if you didn't have the power to overcome it within you, then God never would have said, be happy, because you would have just said, I can't, what, what do you want me to do? I can't help how I feel. Yes, you can, of course you can. And that's the point of the 10th commandment, isn't it? We're told not to steal right pretty early on we're told do not steal but um uh in commandment uh, um well don't steal <laughs> uh, so why the 10th commandment don't desire things of other people right you know surely we would just respond to god hey i can't help what i feel i mean i i covet his uh his nice house. I don't have one. I covered it. No, you're not allowed to. Well, I'm sorry. I can't help how I feel. Yes, you can. And that's the really important lesson of the 10th commandment. God created us to be able to control not what only what we do. That's obvious. Everyone knows that. But to also be able to control how we feel. So please remember that because the next time you feel down and unhappy and sad, hopeless, uh, forlorn, a pessimistic about life just remember it's in your power to control your feelings and overcoming it is one of the commandments one of the ways of making our creator proud of us and making him smile is when we overcome that tendency and in fact we're able to fulfill that commandment in De deuteronomy be happy very important indeed now, uh, last week, you'll remember, I told you about a, um, uh, I, I, I gave a, a, a what if, right, a, th a thought experiment. Fairy Godmother says, you've got a son and a daughter, I'm going to give you a gift for each. How you apportion them is up to you. I'm giving you one gift of self-confidence, I'm giving you one gift of good looks. One of them has to go to your son, one of them has to go to your daughter, you get to pick. And... Uh, I told you how I picked and why, and I discussed the, the role of confidence um, in human uh, affairs. And um, I have to tell you that uh, Mrs. Lappin was not happy. Not at all. She was very unhappy. And uh, I promised that I would give her an opportunity to tell me in front of you what she didn't like, and that's going to happen in just a minute or two. I will tell you this, that um, uh, a, a little while back I had to give a thought experiment of what happens if you are on a lifeboat and you've got a bunch of people saved from a sinking ship and the, there are so many people on the lifeboat that it's down close, the, the gunnels are close to the water, if one more person drags himself out of the ocean onto the lifeboat, then everybody on your boat's going to drown. And so what do you do when one of the other survivors grabs onto the side of the lifeboat? What do you do? And it's interesting that I got many responses more from women than from men, but some from men as well. I got more responses from people saying, well, 
uh, maybe uh, the person could change places. Somebody in the lifeboat could go in the water for a bit and somebody on the water can go in the lifeboat so he can rest. And somebody else said, well, maybe if you spread the, the load, you have moved people around so that it can accommodate one more. It's just, it was so interesting to me to see how many people were simply not going to accept the uh, hypothesis the hypothesis was a given one more person will drown everybody on the lifeboat period and for many people it was just there was too much cognitive dissonance to even contemplate that and so they they were not able to confront that emotionally they were obstructed by the emotional intensity of i'm not going to i'm not going to cause the drowning of that one person in order to save all these others, there must be a way. And yes, in real life, there may well be a way, but this isn't real life. This is a thought experiment. And so uh, similar to that thought experiment, um, and, and I, I thought I made that clear, but, but uh, Mrs. Lappin may not have paid full attention to the part where I said, uh, look, you know, there really aren't any such things as fairy godmothers, and uh, this isn't going to happen in real life. But at least it's an interesting thought experiment to provide a trampoline for a line of thinking. So uh, uh, in a few moments, we'll, we'll do that. I also want to, well, you know what, we'll, we'll tell you about the resource at the store at Rabbi Daniel Lappin, um, dot com coming up, so we'll tell you about that. Uh, oh, I, sh- I should tell you this, that for those of you who, who listen to the show fairly soon after it posts and after it releases... I should tell you that uh, on this Tuesday night, okay, this Tuesday night, that'll be January 7th, um, Mrs. Lappin and I are doing a live Facebook broadcast on my Facebook page, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, uh, where we're going to be discussing uh, anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism going on. Uh, We are going to tell you what part of it is anti-Semitism. We're going to tell you what part isn't. Uh, We are going to also talk about um, whether hate crime legislation turns out to be a good thing, whether that has reduced the amount of bigotry in America, whether it's increased it. So all of that on Facebook, on uh, my main page, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. That's not the friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin. That's a different page. This is going to be on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin page um, on this Tuesday evening. Uh, More information at our website, and uh, we'll do that Facebook Live. I should also tell you, for those of you in the Washington, D.C. area, right, Maryland, Virginia area, um, I am speaking at Bishop Harry Jackson's church, the Hope Connection, in Beltsville, which is just outside Washington, D.C., on Sunday, January 12th. And uh, any of you there, do be sure to come up and say hello. I love meeting uh, people who listen to this show and uh, and cherish the opportunity to get together. So uh, I think, therefore, without much further ado, we'll go to um, Susan Lappin telling me what she didn't like and me trying to explain why what I said was absolutely true and valid. Uh, I also explain why it is that I felt a need to um, have this conversation in public, right? And all of that will become clear in just a moment. So let's move right over to uh, welcoming Susan Lappin. Now to this section of the show... I want to welcome a special and beloved guest, none other than Mrs. Susan Lappin. So are the fireworks going off and there's applause in the background? I assume all the sound effects will be there. Yeah, you know, and and then as usual, there'll be some people who are saying, oh, not again. And then there are other people saying, why doesn't he ever run more often? (laughs) Well, I'm here this time, actually, because it's kind of a point-counterpoint, because I was pretty upset at something you said in last week's show. Right. So just to remind people, last week's show uh, included material on uh, the relationship 
between self-confidence and faith. And the idea being that uh, when one's faith muscle is atrophied, it becomes very difficult to build and maintain self-confidence. And conversely, when one's faith muscle is in good shape, um, it's a little easier to build self-confidence. And then I did a theoretical. I said, what if the fairy godmother offered me a gift for each of my two children? No negotiation. I can't change anything. All I get to do is choose which child gets which gift. And the two gifts were self-confidence and good looks. And I have a son and a daughter. And I said that uh, I wouldn't hesitate to say, well, the only way that I can see that would make sense to allocate those two gifts was to give the good looks to my daughter and the self-confidence to my son. Uh, not to say that um, that there's any advantage in a boy being repugnant and certainly no advantage to a girl in being needy and and utterly lacking in self-confidence, but the value of those two gifts is not equal in the two sexes. And I disagree entirely. And I was, so here's, first of all, do you remember a while ago when you were on the radio? Um, this goes back quite a few years. You were on the radio in San Francisco. You were on the radio in Seattle. You used to do movie reviews. And you had a niche. You had a niche that no other movie reviewer has because you would review movies that you had not seen. Yes, that's right. And, you know, partially... On the basis that there's no shortage of reviewers who just do boring, <laughs> bland, mundane reviews of movies they've seen. But um, I really... I owned that niche. Yes, you did. It was. And what happened was... Aside from giving you a niche, there were movies that you were not going to waste your time seeing or movies that would be detrimental, you felt would be detrimental to your being to see. However, you did want to talk about them and you knew people who were seeing them anyway who were able to give you information. Yeah, there were people so, I trusted, people right. whose evaluation. And they also, by, by um, uh, consolidating a number of discussions with people, I got several right. perspectives on the movie. And uh, the funny thing was that I used to get a lot of mail from yes, people thanking me for those reviews. <laughs> so I just want to point out, I did not listen to the podcast. So I'm now going to object to what you said on the podcast without having actually listened to it. Well, then and you're going to be easy to refute. I won't. But uh, <laughs> I have confidence, you know. <laughs> but um, so what happened? Well, I read. I, by the way, one of the things I mentioned on the podcast is that um, a an excess of confidence. I agree. Overconfidence is a problem. And I just want to point that out because you sound very <laughs> confident indeed. So what happened was I read a description. I read the description that you put out that lets people know what this podcast will be about. And I read it and you were not home at that time. And I read some sentence along the lines of if only your son or daughter can have confidence versus beauty, how do you allocate it? And or does your do your son and daughter need confidence similarly? What, whatever that language was, I looked at it and I sent you quickly a WhatsApp saying, I, I am sure you said that both male and female sons and daughters, men and women need confidence. And your response was, um, I'm coming home soon, which let me know that it, <laughs> you did not say that. And then I thought, okay, well, I better listen and hear what you said. So I did turn on the podcast and I bounced through it until I reached um, the point where you were talking about it. And literally after about eight seconds, I turned it off because I don't like being upset with you and I was getting upset with you. So I decided I don't want to hear anymore. Now, you might have retracted it all and said, hey, that was an April Fool's joke. And if I do it on April 1st, everybody knows it's a joke. So I decided to do it on December or something or other. But I was just getting upset listening to you. And so I, I did not listen. So we can discuss it now. However, you may have to fill me in on, on what, what I you actually said. said. <laughs> <laughs> but what you did say, and, and this yeah. was important, and I thought this was an important point, because ha let's say I didn't know you. And I had a friend who said, hey, I'm really listening to this really interesting podcast. You should listen. To say something that could get somebody so upset, 
within eight seconds that I'm turning you off is doesn't seem to me to be a good marketing decision. In other no, words- it, it wouldn't be. Um, now, I will say that uh, at the time you and I are currently recording this, yeah. um, the uh, podcast under discussion has been out there uh, on the in the world for about uh, three or four days. Right. And um, as is common every week, we get a lot of response. No, I, but it is, was the week of Christmas and New Year. So okay, but we did get a lot of response. Okay. But uh, the interesting thing is that um, although uh, every week we get response and it includes positive as well as negative, um, I mean, more, to be honest, much more positive than negative. But in this case, on this podcast, there has so far not been a single negative. Now, did uh, people who think like you just turn off? Or are there no people who think or, just like when you? Because I, I did see some of the positive. I don't see all the mail, but I did see some. What they were saying is that the, the topic in general was a very helpful one to talk about faith and confidence. Were there specific comments saying, oh, boy, you made a great point about men and women? No, there were. Okay, so I think people that. – so that's a danger because you know you have – how do I say this tactfully? Which since when has that <laughs> ever concerned you? Susan? You know, you you sometimes you know when someone has something valuable, you put up with their ex, um, eccentric, eccentricities, and so I'm wondering if the people a people who may not have known you may have turned off because I found it. I know you. I know that you respect women and love women. Uh, if I didn't know you, I would have turned it off and said, "Boy, that guy is misogynistic." And what could you be? By the way, let me first of all explain to to all you folks uh, why am I doing this? Why am I voluntarily <laughs> subjecting myself to this angry, hostile diatribe from an angry, hostile woman whom I love? I mean, why why am I doing this? And and the answer is because we're married, and uh, in our marriage overwhelmingly I have been the the outside guy and Susan has been the inside guy overwhelmingly we've had a traditional marriage um, where to a large extent Susan has built and maintained a home and a family that provides for me an absolutely reliable haven of tranquility and security and a cocoon of comfort uh, from which I've been able to to launch my many battles and wars out there in the big world. Uh, but that kind of traditional marriage does require that uh, that I also acknowledge that when I speak in public, I am also representing the other half of this marriage. And so a lot of the time, when... I write, almost everything I write gets um, uh, run by Susan. She edits, she makes suggestions, she makes uh, modifications. Some are good, most of them are, are good. Occasionally, I do not choose to go along with something that she suggested. And sometimes I've been right and sometimes I've been wrong. But um, when it comes to spontaneous speaking, and that might be a speech that I didn't uh, that is not based on modules that have already been done that Susan and I have discussed, uh, or on a podcast when we may not have discussed the topic. As in this case, uh, it is very possible that thereafter, as happened in this case, uh, Susan mildly, politely, <laughs> softly, and gently disagrees. <laughs> All right, fine, not exactly like that. Um Look, as I've always said, it is very difficult living with a wonderful wife. Uh, The only thing is, it would be vastly more difficult, verging on the impossible, uh, not living with her. That's that's how I see it. But at any rate, it does mean that uh, in situations like this, where she does disagree, I feel it appropriate for her to have a chance to express that, and ideally to see if we can arrive at some kind of uh, 
uh, agreement. Yeah. At, is it possible that uh, we can either she'll see what I meant but fail to say properly, or I may have to adjust what I said? But at any rate, let's maybe the place to start now is to get uh, some understanding of why you were so indignant in a way you almost never get. Because you very rarely say things that I really find offensive. And I agree with you that when, if I find something offensive, that doesn't necessarily mean somebody else of said something offensive. People today feel offense at all sorts of things. But if I take offense at something you say, then there's something wrong because we, that's not, our relationship isn't that, oh, well, I'm oversensitive or you're undersensitive. We, and I was offended by what you said. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we try and analyze what it was I said that bothered you? Okay. And then we'll determine whether you were excessively thin skinned or whether I said something that was problematic. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. So as literally the eight seconds that I listened to was you were you were making that hypothetical hypothetical case. I have um, confidence and I have beauty and I can give one to each of my children. I have a son and a daughter. I'm going to give beauty to my daughter and confidence to my son. Is that a good summation? Okay. Okay. Now, I'm sure most people listening understand why you came across as a misogynist and an offensive person, but you didn't get it. So let me tell you why <laughs> you did. I, think... I must tell you, Susan, I've, I've, I've had occasion to comment on this from time to time. Um, you, you you don't leave a lot of room for feelings here. But all right, okay, fine, carry on. I'm, I've got broad shoulders. I can take it. Carry on. Okay, here's the problem. I think the question was a – there. I'm going to backtrack. There's a lot of confusion in the world today about male-female relationships, male-female – whether there is such a thing as male or female. I mean, we are in a messed up world when it comes to gender and sex and and men and women. Agreed? Yes. So it is all the more important for those of us who have very strong views, and those views stem out of the Bible, to be careful not to react, to become reactionary where we say wrong things simply because the other side is going to such an extreme, we, in reaction, go to a, a, an equally incorrect or or at all an incorrect extreme. Would you Would you agree with that? Yes. And that's what I feel what you did with this. Right. In other words, I think it would have been perfectly valid to ask a question of, do men and women draw confidence from the same place? Does confidence mean the same thing to, to men and women? How do men and women become confident? Is there a difference? I think all those would have been valid. But by phrasing the question as you did, you, um, I think... Um, gave the Hellenist answer and an anti-biblical answer rather than a biblical answer. And and I'll, I'll tell you why. And partially, there's a lot. I actually have notes because I had so many reasons that I was upset. <laughs> I wrote it down. I didn't yeah. want to forget anything. <laughs> when Susan came into the studio today to record and she walked in with a sheaf of notes, I thought to myself, this, this isn't going to be easy going. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, quite frankly, you have... You're, you're like somebody, you know, you sometimes talk about the vegetarian writing the meat cookbook, the barbecue cook or cookbook. Yes. I feel that's in some ways what your situation you were in. You have been surrounded by confident women, starting with your mother, going through the women who you marry, your daughters, your granddaughters, the women who you work with. You've been surrounded by confident women. So you don't actually know what it's like to be with a woman who's not confident. And so... Let me tell you something about women who are not confident. First of all, they are not beautiful. Women who are not confident slouch. They put their hair kind of in front of their face so the world won't see them. They do, they can't speak in a in a in a way that they can impart a an opinion because they're they're they giggle maybe or they say it softly and they whisper because and, they don't know and they don't stride into confrontations with <laughs> sheaves of notes either I'll tell no you they that. don't in other words they're not attractive so you're saying well if a woman can have beauty but not confidence is a 
well, there's a word for it. It's not an oxymoron, but it's a something. It, it's a contradiction in terms because women without confidence are not okay. going to be beautiful. Uh, so I would respond, not I would, I do respond, okay. that um, what you are doing is uh, doing what uh, we classicists call a reductio ad absurdum which is that uh, you are taking something to an extreme. You used the hold word repugnant before. You said a man is not good for him to be second. repugnant. That's an extreme. That may be. <laughs> but in this context, uh, I did in the podcast, to which I repeatedly <laughs> refer you didn't listen to, uh, I spoke about um, insecurity as not being attractive. Oh, okay. And so what you're defining is something below the zero point. Think of the graph line right. as running from minus 10, negative 10, to zero to plus 10. And let's stipulate that plus 10 is a surfeit of confidence that verges on the arrogant and the tyrannical and the okay. overbearing. And let's... Uh, likewise agree that negative 10 is the kind of insecurity you were just describing of somebody not being able to stand up straight or look someone in the eye or being very, very, in, okay, those are the insecurities. Um, but let us say that plus five is a healthy level of, uh, of confidence and zero is somebody who is not walking around insecurely and slouching and as you said, not looking in the eye, but just you know, just a neutral, not, uh, and there's plenty of people like that who don't radiate confidence, and, but also neither are they looking uncertain. They're just, like many people, just in, in the norm there. And, uh, and so what, what I was saying was, and I eschewed insecurity for both men and women. However, uh, the consequences of a lack of confidence, the consequences on a lack of confidence are more serious for a man than for a woman. The impact on his career, the impact on his ability to make money and his ability mm. to effectively lead, whether he is in, and I spoke of any of the uniformed services or uh, whether it's in business or anywhere else, that's really important. But I think you will agree that uh, a woman who doesn't radiate, does not have that confidence, but is, she might be seen as demure, she might be even seen as modest, but she's not putting herself forward in a way that uh, uh, confidence automatically causes, so, not in necessarily a bad way, not at the plus 10 level, but at the plus okay, 5 level. So I think you're using... See, the problem then is semantics, and you also use the word beauty, at least in the definition description. You I use beauty. attractiveness. I use beauty, Okay, so yes. I've got a few things to say here. All right. Oh. <laughs> of course. You didn't I, think I was just going to give up and say, oh, I didn't understand. You know, I'm shocked you actually have a few more things to say. <laughs> I can't believe that. So, All right, go for it. When you're using... May, you're you're def you're dis differentiating between confidence and there was another word you just used whether Beauty. it's self respect no 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 the, oh, on that, that so there's a bit of a um, oh you're saying that that's being the opposite of demure or modest I don't think being confident I don't think those words are, are antonyms I don't think they're the opposite. And in today's day and age, I think when we talk about self-confidence in some ways, to me, that has to do with self-respect. I feel like I'm a valuable person and I'm doing valuable things with my life. And that gives me confidence. It gives me confidence not to do what the world tells me to do. If I was in, un, in, unconfident, yeah, lacking <laughs> A woman today lacking... Which you can't even imagine. A woman today lacking confidence, let me tell you, is not going to get married and have children because the society is telling her, well, you're valueless That's, if you do that. That is an excellent point. Thank I agree you. with you entirely on that. So yes. you're, you're saying... Just well, say, it one, say it one more time. A woman lacking confidence today is not going to get married or have children if she does get married because she's going to need to prove that she has value by making money because she's accepting society's definition that you only have value if it's monetarily connected and you have to have a tremendous amount of confidence to say, no, I'm going to raise my family because what I'm doing is important. Yeah. So 
may so partially it might be semantic our disagreement but in other words you're saying a man who is confident will earn more money true so a woman who's confident will also earn more money and you're saying it's more important and i agree with you by the way listen for a man when, to earn when earn susan money, says it might be semantic don't for one moment make the mistake <laughs> of thinking she's backing down oh no i'm not backing down i'm saying that you spoke carelessly <laughs> that's all now look, uh, helping you speak more ha- carefully this does not have to be an ad hominem when people uh, f- um, take uh, take um, refuge in ad hominem attack that wasn't an ad hominem that is a sign a mark of insecurity no saying that you spoke carelessly is not an ad hominem it's giving you an out it's saying I know you're a good person who respects women you spoke poorly that's okay. not added hominem attack. I'm afraid I have to reject that <laughs> unconditionally and categorically uh, because I um, did not say anything at all that was disrespectful to the class of people known By as women. By saying beauty is more important than confidence for women, I think you did. And I... I I will reassert and stand by that. Well, wait, let me finish before you decide because I haven't finished my... my comments how many more okay. notes have you got uh, only about 15 or 20 pages <laughs> <laughs> All right. we're gonna we're gonna be done with this conversation one way or the other <laughs> and at some point we should just mention our sale item this week because it's uh pe- you know it's a new year people will be listening to this during a new year and yes. it's a wonderful time to commit to getting a better feel and that's where we're coming from our question is really what would god um have to say about this subject. That's when we're trying to discuss it. It's really coming out. That's where we're getting to. In yes. other words, what would the Bible, what would be the the divine way to, to look at this topic? Yes. And um, do you want to say what we have on sale this week? Please go ahead. We actually have our Genesis Journey set, which if you have not heard it, it's a total of eight CDs, about eight hours on the book of Genesis on specific topics, including men and women. We have one, the uh, Madam I'm Adam, decoding the marriage secrets of Eden. But there's also one, Tower of Power, that deals with socialism. There's one, the Gathering Storm, that deals with what was going on in the world that led to the flood. And that's part of my notes, actually. Okay. And another one on Israel and Islam. And if you have not listened to these programs, I, I totally... Um, really with no self-interest if somebody else produced these programs i would say the same thing you really have to listen to them and they are actually at the lowest price they've ever been they can be downloaded and then you get a pdf of the study guide if you get it by mail you get a study guide in the mail that's really quite pretty it's um color and everything 16 pages and um i really urge you i i i'm not sure how long this will remain on sale but it's a fantastic um, by it's also a fantastic thing to listen to with your spouse or a friend or your children because it will provoke all sorts of conversations and you'll be amazed at what jumps out of the pages of Genesis. Getting back to the subject at hand. Right. And one of the things that drives you crazy is I quote you to you very often when I'm trying <laughs> to disagree with you. <laughs> so you will recall that you said... You talk sometimes about winning the ovarian lottery. Yes. Okay. Beauty is something that you win in the ovarian lottery. Some people are born beautiful. Most people are not. Most people are born with the ability to be attractive. Very yes. few people are born mm-hmm. repugnant. Very few people are born absolutely stunning. Most people have the ability to be attractive. Yes. Now, here, if you had you said this, I would have agreed with you, that for a woman, feeling attractive is one of the things that gives her confidence. Okay, that's that's, uh, that's a good point. And I, I, will, I would agree with I that. I will make a biblical point at that because ancient Jewish wisdom tells us, for example, that it is an absolute requirement for a Jewish community to have a source of cosmetics that for women to access. Yes. So I'm proving my point from the... From the Bible, basically. Yes. Um, so, yes. So, that's why I said, had you spoken about are there different sources of confidence, I would have said fine. But when you talk about confidence, women and men, I think, may need it for different reasons, but they both okay, but need it. Just to clarify, I wasn't talking sources. Um, if I had been, I would have s- focused on other external factors as well. There's no question about it that being appropriately dressed is a help for men as well. Mm-hmm. It is an important thing. And um, 
and a legitimate source of self-confidence. Um, there are there are many books about dressing for success. They are not nonsense. Uh, they may take it a little far, but the point is valid. So yes, uh, if a man feels well dressed, that will contribute to his self confidence. And if a woman feels that she is attractive, no question about it. And um, and 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 one sees that. So I agree so, with that. But I was not really speaking about those external ways in which to attain confidence. Well, and I think you could have. That would have been a valid thing to talk about. But to talk about having to choose beauty or confidence, I would choose confidence for my daughters as well as my son. Both of them need confidence because not I'm. Let it, me fill Not if it was at the cost of looks. If it was, I would still choose that because a, because a girl who feels confident, even if she's unattractive, will come across as more attractive to people. As more attractive, and but not if she has to choose, attractive. I would choose. I would. It doesn't matter. Can I tell? Now this is where I'm going to go into. Sorry, in that Genesis <laughs> journey set. No, you got to let me finish. First of all, um, okay. I dis I I tr- I totally object to the idea that beauty is necessary for women or desirable. And now I'm going to atta- I'm going to approach it from the point of view of the woman at, or the most desirable. Now, I mean it's nice. It's a nice bonus. You know, hey, right? And if it's a nice bonus for a guy if he's 6 feet because we know that men who are taller earn more money and they get more respect. That is a, so I'm not saying a, it's not a, a nice bonus, that's but a I'm saying parallel. but yes. in other words to say it's the most if you would say to a man well, like you could be 6 feet tall or you could have confidence, you wouldn't say, "Oh, I guess I'm going to have to choose 6 feet" because it's an external thing that the person's internals can overcome. Yes. But you can't overcome the opposite, which is a character trait. So you will remember that one of my favorite books is Pink and White Tyranny. You may need to just give a little bit of a quick book review. I will. So Pink and White Tyranny is um, a book by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe is best known for Uncle Tom's Cabin, which famously Abraham Lincoln said was the book that started the Civil War. She wrote another book called Pink and White Tyranny. So we're talking the 1800s. And in this book... Um, there are basically two messages. There is a a man from New England, and I think the idea of being from New England, first of all, Harriet Beecher Stowe was from New England, but the idea was that these are people who are frugal and wise and hardworking, and such a man goes off to a vacation and comes back with a wife, and she is basically pink and white fluff. She is very beautiful, and he fell for the beauty, and she knew how to flirt. That's the only um, talent that she perfected. She spent her life perfecting the talent to, to flirt to get a husband. And the story then deals with him coming home with this totally infatuated with this woman and now having to try to live a life with her. And she's really quite an empty-headed, um, unaccomplished uh, he basically he realizes he made a terrible mistake, and of course he rejected a perfectly attractive but not gorgeous woman who was the neighbor next door with whom he could have built a really true partnership. So when you talk about beauty for a woman, I find it offensive because you know what? If you want beauty in your life, get a picture and put it at the table opposite you, and then you can look at beauty all the time. But you cannot do that with a woman, and if a woman is told, and this is what I feel you are implying, that beauty is so important to her, then first, so many bad things are going to happen. First of all, and I'll, I'll just, again, give a biblical proof for this, men are told, do not go after your eyes. So it's not, uh, if uh, there was a woman, you, I heard, I did hear this, I heard this just from walking past the door as you were doing the podcast. You spoke about a man being too attractive, it, it could be a, a negative let me tell you how a woman being too attractive is a negative. You remember we once read a story of a woman who was an heiress. And so when she met men, she never gave her full name to the point that when she was really about to get engaged to someone, he was sure she was a CIA agent because she was would give so little information about herself. Her concern was that having money was going to make men want to be with her for the wrong reason. Same thing a woman who's too beautiful. A woman who is too beautiful has to really worry that men are going to be infatuated with her and never see beneath the surface. And what they want is a picture. 
They want to sit down and look at something pretty. And that's not what a partner is. When you get married, you're getting a partner. And you need way more. Certainly, there has to be physical attraction between going both ways. A woman and a man should both be physically attracted to each other. But if you're going to talk about beauty being important for a woman, I think it can be a negative. A woman who's too beautiful actually has problems because it's hard Again, for people I to look at her. Again, I think you may be taking it to an extreme. Well, you use the word beauty. You do. Yes, and I, I do use the beauty. Ena isha elale yofi, says the uh, ancient Jewish wisdom. You want to start clearly. quoting, you want to start throwing little things from the Gemara around. I'll start throwing other things around. No, Check no, out. Okay, you really I'll have yofi too. I understand. As the mother of six daughters and, uh, and uh, having a couple of granddaughters, I, I understand your personal concern. However, uh, there is no question about it. I stand by my assertion that if I have a daughter to whom I can bequeath either good look, and I used good looks as much as I used beauty, although I have no objection to the word beauty, uh, or confidence, I would bequeath her beauty because the confidence she can acquire you're exactly right. You just, no, 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 no. no I don't no, want. You must let me finish. Okay, but. No, you must be quiet oh, now. Oh, my goodness. No. Oh, them's fighting words. Okay. Now you must just be <laughs> quiet for just a moment. <laughs> you may not turn this podcast into what passes for our dinner table conversation. <laughs> <laughs> where I follow the biblical dictum of using two ears to one mouth, <laughs> listening twice as much as I talk. Because <laughs> you're eating, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also true. Uh, so, uh, so I would, um, I would, I would again repeat: uh, we're not talking about. Ex- I'm not talking about uh, movie star good looks, or what, or what we mean these days when we use that phrase. But uh, again, of course, there is the, there is a range, and uh, there is no question about it that there are many women who are head turners. <coughs> when you, you pass a woman like that in the street, uh, your head swivels unavoidably, and that doesn't necessarily mean that she's got movie star looks, but she's got something that just resonates with you. Uh, but I will tell you, very seldom is she going to be an unattractive woman. Now, whether that attractiveness is a radiation of certain internal qualities or whether it is just winning the ovarian lottery, in other words, a uh, just a, a lucky accident of birth, having the right genes, nobody ever really knows on those things because the great mysteries of male-female attraction uh, is something that God built into the world, and we don't always understand it. But uh, tell me, because I, I do want, we, we do need to sort of wind this oh, down. Oh, no, I'm not winding this down yet. So <laughs> <laughs> move, move right along. Okay, so male-female attraction, attractiveness is subjective. There are many women who their husbands find attractive, and that's what I want for my girls. I don't need my girls to turn heads on the street. I want them to have a man, who, one man, who finds them attractive and cherishes them. And it's, again, a repeat that being too beautiful, in effect, is you have to start being suspicious because it's too easy for a man to be attracted to you. For a woman, a a normal level of attractiveness, and most women can achieve that. And yes, that's why women do use makeup, and you do pay attention to dress. And as you said, it's important for men as well. But women can do more to change what they look like. Um, But... I so we're not talking this this I felt that you made a very bad decision to make this an either or confidence or beauty. That's my biggest complaint with you. That or attractiveness. In other words, I disagree completely and if my daughter's going to be confident in herself that she's a valuable person, but she's going to be and she'll only be attractive to one man, that's all she needs. I don't but to I would never have her be not confident in exchange for being someone who, you know, who is going to be approached and said. All right, so we we do either or tests all the time. But this, sometimes they're fake. Sometimes we they're fake and they're foolish. We do either or tests all the time where we say, well, let's imagine you could only, you've got enough money to buy this or that. Which would you do? 
And it's very possible that in real life, somebody would say, well, in real life, I'm going to rather wait, save up so I can afford them both. It may well be. But, but still, there is value. I in don't think a, there was value in this one. Excuse me. <laughs> well, because you're saying we're running out of time, so I have to talk more. Because then <laughs> you, it's your show. You get to keep on talking. <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that that may be true. Yeah, that may be true. And I just will point out, we just finished the fest, um, the holiday of Hanukkah, and there's an excellent program you should listen to called Festival of Lights, transforming your 24-7 life existence, existence into a 25-8 life. You should listen to it because we talk about the biblical view of beauty versus the Hellenist view of view, beauty. And I think that you were representing the Hellenist view of beauty, not the biblical view of beauty. All right. In Let me just ask thing. you, in, in your voluminous notes, are there any <laughs> other points you, you're you going yeah, to Yeah, well, one thing I just wanted to point out, that again, if, I, if, if my feeling good about myself comes from my looks, and that's if, that's, if I overemphasize the importance of looks, um, I feel very sorry for my husband because... First of all, it's going to cost him a pretty penny because I'm going to have to, that's what I'm going to have to focus on. And you don't have the foggiest notion how much money women can spend on this because I don't do it. But you don't do it because you are fortunate. You don't need no, to do it. No, that's not true. That's no, totally untrue. It's because I'm miserly. <laughs> Susan, but, <laughs> the correct word you were seeking there is frugal. frugal okay. But, you know, if you tell me the most important thing about me is my looks, that that's then I need a lot of money and I need a lot of time to constantly go for spa treatments and constantly get the best clothing and constantly go for makeup and constantly go. You can't afford it. Let me let me just tell you this. You can't afford me if you may if you tell me that beauty is so is what is really high, high, high up on the way I look. And um if Wait. you could see what's happening now in the studio, <laughs> you'd see Susan frantically <laughs> paging through her pages of notes <laughs> for her next point. <laughs> I just feel no. So I'm telling you that I think, it's, and I do think, I think it's anti-biblical. Not that women should be a, should be attractive. That is that is something God built into the world, and that's fine. But you'll in in one of those programs. Oh, in the Genesis Journey set that we're talking about, that's actually on sale this week. There's a guy called Lemech, you'll recall, and Lemech wanted to have one woman for beauty, one wife for beauty and one wife for children and i will tell you that if you tell me that being beautiful this, is by the one way of, lemech was one of the descendants of cain in the book of genesis and one of the interested. antecedents of noah um different different lemech completely different mrs there, noah then there are there are no um there are no really long there are no uh descendants. mrs noah um uh, mrs noah uh is a um is, Isn't she a, a descendant of Lemma? She is, yes, that's right. Okay, yeah. Nama, okay. Yeah. So if you, he he wanted a wife who would stay beautiful. Again, you know what? I can never have children. If you're telling me that my value, a lot of my value comes from beauty, I will not have children. Because you know what? Morning sickness is not attractive. I need to know that I have a man who's going to stand by me and find me attractive even when I'm retching. And who's going to be interested in what I have to say. You have having, high standards, I'm yes, tell you. <laughs> having children is not something a woman can afford to do if she is worried about looks. Okay, yes, you're, you're taking it to extreme. So That's not an extreme, that's reality. Right, but even if you have children, um, the, uh, the number of days in your life in which you suffered from morning sickness is strictly limited. Okay, I was pregnant for 10 years solid. So, <laughs> yes, you were. And I had to trust... Because I told you at the outset <laughs> that my belief is you've got to be pregnant and in the kitchen. That's that's it. Yeah, but once but you, you've but also if you tell be beautiful. me the most important thing is beautiful, oh, no, then I, I can't said beautiful do that. As well. No, then I can't do okay. that. And uh, wait, one more. Okay, last, okay. last. And after you made... Wait, it went out of my head. But... Um, Anyway, it's just that that's just not right, so o- it's not okay back, to tell a woman it's not okay to overemphasize both for women or for men that to make beauty more than it is. It's not good for men because it's against the biblical injunction don't follow after your eyes. In other words, you're giving the wrong message to men if you say to them, "Hey, beauty is real like on the list of the top 5 things you need, beauty is number 1." Yep. No, maybe it's like 14 or 15. No, I, I attractiveness, yes. I wouldn't no, agree again, with you. Attra- being attracted, yes. Not that she's beautiful, that you right, find her I beautiful. I am not really 
um, talking about the subtle nuances that exist between the English word beauty and the English word attractive. No, because attractive is attractive to each it's individual. Subjective. It's like food, right? Is, you know, is um, spaghetti oh, you're not, delicious? You're not going well, to some people, step yes, into some my people food know. Now, well, I'm just you? saying that it's a very personal thing. And between men and women, the attraction needs to be only between two people. It has to be, there has to be, a, there has to be a level of attraction, but no one else. And a lot of okay. men, and this is one of the things that Hollywood does because they airbrush and they have women who are on, on all sorts of medications to keep their health down. And, and Hollywood does terrible things and modeling does terrible things to women in order to be quote unquote attractive. And any man who gives that as his standard of attractiveness is heading down a really, really bad path. And for the woman herself, it makes you shallow and it makes you, if, if that's what you're going to focus on, you're not going to focus on the things that actually make you a good marriage partner, a good mother, a good member of society. And and so let me just, I'll close now. because Every, <laughs> When you hear Susan's voice go up like that, what's happened is I've opened my mouth. <laughs> I'm about to say close. something. I just want to say. <laughs> I get the impression you just want to say. Yes. The kids would recognize the look on my face now. It's not a look you might recognize, but you could do the show look my face to any of our kids and they will say, this is the look that mommy gives when the response is, I made a mistake. I'm wrong. I will be more careful in the future. That's what you're saying? That's what I'm saying is what you should say now. Oh, what I'm... No, no, no <laughs> that's I'm, what I'm afraid saying. I, That's the look that the kids get all, to know. That's the response they need to all, give. All I, I was wrong. Oh, I see. That's the response. Your yeah, response I'm sure that's only be, I was wrong. Uh, I will say this, that you are beautiful when you're passionate. <laughs> no question about it. And uh, so is that it? Have you had your say? No, but you told me that we have to pull it to an end. I'm just... You I still just, haven't. No, because until you've changed your mind, I haven't... Done okay, a good enough so job. tell me what ex- narrow this down to exactly what you think I said that needs to be changed and how you'd want to change it. Okay, I first of all I wouldn't have asked the question. I think it was a just I just think it's a okay, but foolish that, question. But, well, I I reject that criticism as ad hominem and invalid. Okay, so I would say both men and women confidence, which is an internal thing, is more important than anything external. If you're going to insist and and take it to ad absurdum, as you say, that you can only have one, then the internal, something that comes internally from you, is more than something that is fleeting and, and will go away. And, <laughs> first of all, but also, by the way, if I marry you and, and I think you're marrying me for beauty, I'm going to have a divorce plan and I'm going to have as much money put away as I can because guess what? The re- and this is in Festival of Lights. The real reality of aging is a 45, a 35, a 65-year-old woman is never going to match a 22-year-old woman. So I know that you're not committing. If you've got a, a miss okay. focus any, on any beauty, regular... I'm out of here. I'm out of here when I can get out. <laughs> so I don't think you want to go down this path personally. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I may be suffering from oxygen poisoning here because there have been so many times I've opened my mouth, taken a breath preparatory to speaking, and then have you raise your voice and dive in to the microscopically short pause. Uh, so um, so okay. anybody listening, anyone who is a regular listener to the show will know that um, at no stage did I ever say that uh, beauty is the most important thing in selecting marriage. That just wasn't the topic. I never said that last week. These are things that uh, that you are thinking you didn't when, hear. No, when you say... Uh, 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 not done yet. Okay. Um, then... Dig your, d- no, dig uh, your uh, pit uh, deeper. Uh, 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 not done yet. <laughs> I ask you whether in your formulation yes. that men and women both need confidence and uh, would you then not uh, agree that there is any difference at all between men and women in the need for that particular commodity? I would say that there's not a difference in the need. There's a difference in how they acquire it and how they represent it. But I kind of take confidence as self-respect. You feel good about yourself. And I think men and women both and have I, to feel good I about don't themselves. Feel, I don't think that that's correct. Self-respect is 
is feeling good about yourself, as you said. Confidence is feeling um, sure moving forward. It's not about what you have done as much as it is about the future. That's why I tied it to something called faith, because you cannot yet see the outcome. Confidence is pushing ahead, believing that the outcome will be good. That's not self Okay, then I do believe that both men and women need confidence. And as I said, I would not go ahead and get married or have children if I didn't have confidence. That, that that is certainly so true. So I think women need it. That is certainly true, and uh, I I would ag- agree without question that that is uh, that that part is true. Um, well, I'm glad you recognize the error of your ways, <laughs> so we can end here. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Well, I think we have to because uh, I, I time is. I, I really thought it would. It, I thought we would reach a point where you would submit uh, sooner than this. But um, but uh, if we had to wait till now for, for your... you to submit, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, you loyal, happy warriors, <laughs> listeners of the show, I'm going to leave it to you all to determine. And uh, I'm going to ask you to say whether um, Susan is, in fact, Beating me into submission on something. No, I don't want to say that. Because I don't or, beat you into submission. But that I had a val- I had valid points and you could have no, you, spoken better. You have valid points. But did those valid points invalidate my theoretical formulation of if I had to choose? Yes. Okay. I, I, in other words... I would choose confidence for both. You would choose confidence for one and beauty for the confidence other. Confidence wasn't... That wasn't an option. Well, the fairy god I thought it was confidence. ...gave an option of one... You you have one gift of confidence and one dose of good looks. Well, I and would how just, are you going to I would pull them? out. You pull out your Uzi and you get rid of that do. fairy grandmother and get another one. I, you were going to grab her by the neck and twist her till <laughs> she yielded. I don't yielded. accept. Yeah. I no, I understand. You have a very direct approach. There's no no doubt about it. But um, at any rate, ladies and gentlemen, what you do is you go to our website at rabbidaniellappin dot com. Uh, by the way, you can also reach the website rather cutely, I think, with youneedarabbi.com. But either way, you go there, and when you find the uh, the tab which says About Us, there is a way to contact us. And if you use that, we would love to hear your reactions to this discussion. I have another way. Can you I just a, give another way? Another because way, Because yes. our oh, Facebook page, we yes. have friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan that's Lappin actually, that's Facebook a great page. Idea. And that would be actually a better idea than contacting us because then you'll be sharing it and, st- and stimulating conversation with other podcast listeners. So The lady is right on this. I know. Not on anything else, but on this she's Most right. Most things. Some things, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called Friends of uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Daniel, Daniel and Susan, Susan Lappin. Lappin. You do have to... Um, answer a few questions to be admitted to the group because we really are not interested in trolls and we're not interested in people who are not the type of people we want to associate with. So, but it's it's very simple. You answer those questions, you get admitted to the group, and then go on and start a conversation and say, hey, I heard this podcast. And um, I will not try to guide the witness to suggest what you might want to say. So you choose. Look, you can't exert... <laughs> The same kind of influence and power over everybody that you have over me. But I could try. (laughs) So, as I said in last week's show, there is such a thing as women having a little too much confidence. I'm just mentioning that. Not in any attempt to influence your... But the threshold is much higher for men than for women. That's a whole other discussion. It is. Which we don't have time for. Another one on which I think I'm correct. Well, we don't know. You haven't said what you think yet, so we'll discuss it. (laughs) All right. Okay, folks. So this gives you a little (laughs) glimpse, maybe a little more of a glimpse than you really wanted, into the private conversations and interactions between Mrs. Lappin and her husband. Thanks so much for, uh, for hearing us out on this. And if you do join the discussion either by writing to us or by going on to uh, Facebook, Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin, 
uh, we'll join in there and we will definitely let you know which way the tide of opinion moved on this little conversation. Um, okay, so we'll leave the, uh, the, the, the discussion with Susan and me at this point, and uh, I will continue alone uh, to wrap up. Well, I've got a, a couple of other points because we are talking about the power of negativity, and I'll wrap that up a little bit as we car- uh, carry on with the Rabbi Daniel Appen show in this particular episode. I spoke uh, about the impact of negativity on you and on me. But what I also want to remind you is that there are other people in our lives who are also subject to exactly the same thing. This is a universal human tendency, just as each and every one of us has an inbuilt resistive force, I call it spiritual gravity, that makes us prefer to do things that are not good for us, prefer to do things that contradict our own plans, goals, and ambitions. Uh, We prefer to do things that are unhealthy and unwise. So it is that everybody has a spiritual gravity in them that drags them towards occasional periods of gloom, of pessimism, of just being unhappy and down. So I've got to tell you that, number one, uh, you have no moral right to inflict that upon the people you live with and work with. That's a really important point. You have no moral right. That's part of why we are told in the great morality manual, be happy because it is cruel to the people around you to inflict them with that dark cloud you've got hanging around yourself. Don't do it. It's a wrong thing to do. You are doing a bad thing. You are doing an immoral thing. So that's one of the reasons to uh, become more and more adept at being able to control our feelings so that we don't make the people we live with or the people we work with infected with our own particular down spirit. And it's it's horrible because I knew somebody once who did this, who'd who'd come in in the morning miserable and, and just grouchy and whiny. And you could see from his expression that the weight of the world was on his shoulders was absolutely horrible. And then after he'd had his morning coffee, he was fine and bubbly and bouncy. Everything was back to normal. Meanwhile, he had, uh, he had really infected a whole lot of other people around who who were not able to overcome it that quickly. You really are impacted by the people around you, and you impact the people around you. And so um, just be aware that it is, it's a moral issue. I mean, it is literally a moral issue. Uh, you are doing something immoral by walking around exuding an atmosphere of gloom and misery and whininess and complaininess and and negativity because it it does become contagious. That's one thing. The second thing is also be aware that um, uh, it is possible that uh, the that you know, that people with whom you live or people with whom you work um, are going through something like that. And they may not have the knowledge about it that you now have. And um, and so make allowances for that when when you sometimes get behavior from somebody else that is irritating you or trying to pull you down or having a negative impact on you. Just recognize what's going on. And that is that they are have have surrendered to an attack of negativity And remembering that, unfortunately, uh, negativity is more powerful than positivity in that sense, and that it takes much more positivity to overcome uh, negativity than it takes negativity to overcome positivity, if you'll pardon the mangling of those words. Um, Just be aware. Now, if it's somebody uh, with whom you have enough of a relationship that you can sit down and teach them a little bit about negativity and uh, dealing with it and overcoming it and the fact that it is part of a moral obligation. 
and far more important than not blowing secondhand smoke, and far more important than trying to stop the rise of the ocean levels, and far more important than um, preventing carbon dioxide coming into the atmosphere, and far more important than promoting electrical cars, is the moral imperative of being happy. It's a wonderful gift to the people around you, and uh, in a marriage, it's an incredible thing. When a, uh, a husband and a wife are, are, have both trained themselves and acquired the ability to be happy, it's a fantastic thing. Because that way, when uh, whoever's driving takes a wrong turn, and I, yeah, I know it's going to be the guy, uh, because he refused to look at a map or he refused to turn on the GPS or he refused to ask for directions, um, they're able to laugh at it instead of it turning into an argument. And, uh, and that's a good thing because, again, because of the um, added advantage that negativity enjoys over positivity, when there is a squabble between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife, uh, it is very hard to put right it can be done and you've all learned how to do it obviously but um, trying to make it not happen in the first place takes a lot less energy than fixing it up afterwards so please just be aware that um, negativity is the atom bomb of the world of emotions it's there we're all subject to it and yes we are also equipped with the antidote our creator did give us the ability to correct for it and fix it up. Um, that brings us close to the end of today's show. For those people who listen immediately after the show is released, uh, I'll give you some dates. It's not relevant to those of you listening a week or two or a month or a year later. Uh, you, you can still enjoy the show. I hope you did, but it's irrelevant to you that on uh, Tuesday night, January the 8th, where uh, Susan Lappin and I are doing a Facebook Live. Um, we're doing it on anti-Semitism and um, hate crimes. Uh, we're going to deal with questions, are the attacks against Jews really anti-Semitism, or is, the, is something else going on? Did the hate crime legislation by the Obama administration in 2009, did that reduce hate crime? Uh, or Lastly, is blaming the victim always wrong? So we'll cover all of that on the live broadcast on Facebook. Uh, my page is called You Need a Rabbi on Facebook, and we'll be doing that this Tuesday night, January 8th. January 12th, Sunday morning, I'm speaking at Hope Connection Church, Bishop Harry Jackson's church in Beltsville on the outskirts of uh, Washington, D.C. So if you're anywhere near that area and you'd like to come, I'd love to meet you. And uh, the uh, product, Susan told you about that. We'd love to have you visit the store, write to us, and uh, also visit our friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin Facebook page. Um, these are just attempts we are making to build more of a community. You know, ordinarily as a rabbi, uh, I used to, when I had a synagogue and I was the rabbi of the synagogue I founded in Southern California, you know, it was a community and it was a real live community where people showed up for Bible study, they showed up for prayer, worship. Uh, in, in the world in which we live today, that's not really so feasible. So we, we do our best to try and make sure there's, there's genuine two-way connection and two-way communication. Uh, with all of you. So anyway, I hope you understand that's what we're trying to do, and I hope you find that uh, amenable. So uh, until next week, I am your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. I want to wish you a week of good times. That's right, good times with God, good times with your family, good times with your money, and good times with your friends, and uh, until the next week, God bless.